strong health science justification for regulating exposures within uh, a thousand feet of road roadways with heavy traffic. There's some precedent for this in uh, uh, Southern California, which is really, uh, or in California, which has really led led the way in this uh, uh, school construction. In schools in California, uh, are not supposed to be uh, built within 500 free feet of a freeway by uh, state law, and um, uh, it used to be that low-income housing construction in LA County was not eligible for uh, public funding if it was within uh, 500 feet of a freeway. I don't know if that's still still the case, but. Uh, um, uh, that was, I think, a, a very, you know, a, a health, a health relevant uh, um, constraint on development that uh, that could be implemented. And then, uh, you know, these are these are expensive, uh, and developers don't like them. So there's uh, always a lot of concern, uh, consideration of, you know, well, will anything else work? Uh, filters in. In uh, ventilation systems, for example, foliage that uh, screens uh, buildings from from major roadways, and uh, yeah, I can tell you why I think some skepticism and further study of this is in order before a policy is is implemented in that regard. So there's some. It's not all bad news. Um, there are some great opportunities coming up. Uh, planning for SB 375, the G greenhouse gas. Uh, a reduction initiative through uh, 2035 um, is going to result in cleaner or zero emission vehicles. Uh, a big part of the way that California is proposing to reach the ambitious goals that have been set by the bill is to uh, uh, develop, to redevelop the city to make it more uh, transit, uh, transit oriented by uh, uh, increasing population density, having uh, denser uh, housing and uh, local amenities that denser housing would, uh, uh, denser population would support to increase uh, the use of uh, public transit and reduce the number of vehicle miles traveled, which is the major source of uh, pollution in, uh, in Southern California. And there's no question that there are going to be some very clear health co-benefits from reducing uh, regional, regional pollution and probably some other health benefits from more parks, bike lanes, uh, and development conducive to uh, uh, to walking. So, uh, as always, the devil's in the detail, and um, transit-oriented development uh, also can present a uh, dilemma. Here's an example that you see of a very nice uh, 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 high-density housing unit in the background there, and uh, it's right across the street from a, a, metro, a metro rail stop that makes it quite convenient for people to uh, uh, to get to work or to uh, travel without using a car. Um, but if you go to the other side of that, uh, that condo complex, you can see that it's, it's right on, I think this is the five, uh, the five uh, freeway, really close enough that you could spit and hit a windshield. Um, and here's another view looking, uh, looking up from the, uh, from the freeway. I don't know if you can appreciate it in this uh, in this picture, but these uh, these very nice uh, condos are not only right next to the to the freeway, but they have some uh, as an amenity. They have balconies that overlook the freeway and will have you know very high levels of uh, of uh, near roadway pollution. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop here. There's uh, there's a sort of a a, a punchline, and that th that's that there we have we have some great opportunities. To, to look for win-win uh, solutions. And I think uh, one of those might be uh, to uh, regulate development so that uh, to the extent that we can, there's less dense housing within uh, near buffers of freeways. And they don't have to be large buffers, as I pointed out, really 1,000 feet, even 500 feet uh, is far enough that it dramatically reduces uh, levels of uh, of exposure, and it has you know it has relevance for you know for what the city will look like 20 or 30 years years from now. And I think if we you know if we're if we're clever, that we can have a city that will be um, uh, more transit oriented and also healthier. Um, and it's a it's a challenge. I mean, I know some of you on the on the board are concerned about 
low-income housing for people and housing generally for, for, for people. And uh, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's challenging because the cheapest housing might be, some of the cheapest land is along uh, major freeway corridors like this. Um, we put on a conference uh, a few months ago on uh, obesity parks and near roadway pollution and it was uh, speaking with community groups it was it was quite challenging trying to figure out where uh, there are ways that parks could be built that wouldn't be right along uh, uh, major major traffic corridors in some uh, some communities so great thank you so much I'd like to open this up for questions from the commissioners Dr. Mandel Thank you for a concise and wonderful presentation. Um, several questions. One is, um, obviously, uh, this is the airborne. Um, is there a difference, or did your studies look at how high people lived in um, this dense housing? So for example, like in the Bronx, uh, where I know you spent some time, um, there's all these freeways that um, have uh, Major Deacon, for one has high density housing up in the whole length of the Deacon. Um, do kids who live on the upper floors do better than kids who live on the lower floors? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. I mean, we don't, this being Southern California, we don't have a lot of children in our uh, cohorts that live, live sort of many stories above, uh, above street level. So we couldn't, we couldn't address that. Um, there have been studies done in other parts of the uh, country, New York in uh, particular, looking at uh, uh, levels of pollution in, uh, in among at different levels of, uh, of high rises, and it, it, the answer is uh, it depends. In general, there's you know you get some dilution as you go up, but you also get uh, uh, in in cities like New York, you get canyons get a canyon effect and then you get sort of very concentrated uh, pollution in that uh, canyon that you know, will extend right up to quite to quite high levels. Another question is obviously there's an age effect. We know that the young kids lungs are, are more susceptible uh, but is there an age where people are no longer susceptible? Um, you know they these in general the effects of air pollution are seen in early life because there's rapid organ uh, development uh, and uh, at the end of life you know those are sort of those are the two susceptible times of life and uh, you know for for neurodegenerative disease for example uh, you know that's that's a late that's a late life uh, effect for chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary disease that's a late life effect and there's some evidence that you get accelerated decline in uh, lung function if you're exposed to air pollution uh, late late in life uh, my guess is that their their susceptibility throughout life but in sort of adult life up until uh, late age we don't notice it you know it's it's you don't get you might be having effects, but you don't get sick, and the effects may show up may show up later. You mentioned also about parks, and obviously that's an issue. You don't necessarily want people running around and breathing more rapidly and taking in more particulate matter. Um, but is the issue really living next to, um, or alternatively, it's also people sh just shouldn't be around that young kids, meaning? Yeah. Well, well, it's. I mean, I think the issue. The issue is dose, and because people spend so much time at home, and residents, that's, that's the key determinant of how much pollution, uh, pollution you get. So, so homes and secondarily school, you know, parks, you'd prefer people not to, uh, not, you know, it's not as pleasant an experience if you have a park right next to a, 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 major, a major road, but um, uh, that's, Generally, a small proportion of the uh, of the day, and even if your even if exercises increases the dose of pollution that you get because you're ventilating uh, uh, ventilating more, uh, the benefits of exercise are so large that I, I think in you know the verdict is still out, but in general, uh, exercise is good for you. 
may not be quite as good if you're exercising in a polluted environment, but uh, exercise is a good thing. Thank you. And the last question is, um, there are uh, um, cities that have tunnels like uh, Paris or uh, Washington, D.C., in Manhattan, by the FDR, there's a covered area from the, I guess, the mid-40s past the United Nations all the way up to uh, like the 80s uh, on the east side. Um, when roadways are covered, um, is there any data on uh, particulate matter outside in those uh, communities and or in children's uh, respiratory abilities who live next to the, those covered roadways? That's a that's a good uh, that's a good question. Um, certainly, in the tunnels, levels are, are yeah. quite high. You know, the exposures right. exposures to uh, to passenger uh, vehicles. This has come up in the context of the of the proposal to uh, to build a tunnel for the seven seven ten freeway uh, under south under South Pasadena, and that of course would would uh, protect people from the pollution that they would get if it were an open free that freeway that was going going through. But uh, uh, the proposals all involve uh, some ventilation system, actually quite large stacks. It turns turns out that would uh, uh, would ventilate the um, the tunnel at, along the way, and then at the two at the two entrances and levels there, of course, will be quite high. So if you live if you live right around the ventilation systems, then then uh, you know those those levels can be can be quite high. And there's no filtering ability to do that. You uh, they can be filtered. I mean, it's hard to it's hard to ventilate the um, the entrances. Uh, you could you could you could filter the the stacks. There has been discussion of of covering the 101 um, not so far from here um, and creating a great park. Um, but w so would you think, given the knowledge and the, uh, of the literature that you, you have, that if one were going to, say, cover the 101 downtown and, and create a great park, um, or where you showed us on the 110 I took to get here from West Los Angeles, mm -hmm. um, just, just uh, west of here, if you covered that and created great parks, um, would the particulate matter that's created in those tunnels um, would it be possible for those to be filtered and protected so that people could live um, above and, and not have the problems that you've just represented to us? I don't know. I mean, that the, uh, you know, what, I've, what little I've seen in the paper, it hasn't come up as an issue. And, you know, I, I, would, I would think that, you know, the city would want to think about that and do some simulations make some measurements to determine what what the exposures would be in those parts. Do you have models that you use in the laboratory that could simulate that kind of phenomena? Uh, well, most of most of the of the exposures that we assign are based on models that take account of you know traffic volume, what the emissions is from from uh, vehicles, and you know wind speed and uh, direction that. Uh, Help estimate exposures at homes, and I'm, I'm sure you could. I'm, I'm sure you could. You could simulate that. You could make measurements, and my guess is, that, you know, people have done those measurements around the world. I'm just off the top of my head. I, I, I haven't. Okay. I can't Thank think you. of anything. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. All. Uh, are there any? Um, any work with filtration devices or air purification yeah. devices that people have put into apartments? I mean, we, whoops, we, we have a bunch of apartments, but I mean, we're stuck with them. There's a lot of housing near freeways, and it's unlikely to go away. It may take a while to lower the emissions uh, significantly, although I think we should work on that. Is it possible to sort of retroactively clean up the air a bit with some of these various devices that are around? Yeah. So there's, there's. Uh, this has been studied mostly in the context of schools, and uh, the 
South Coast Air Quality Management District, which is uh, the regulatory agency for Southern California and is probably probably the best agency of this type in the uh, in the country, has um, has uh, funded uh, has has funded uh, manufacturers to develop filters that could be put in uh, in schools. They're, you know, they pull out. Uh, not only all the regional pollutants, but they'll also pull out the uh, the smallest the smallest particles. And they've uh, uh, they've shown that under controlled con conditions, they really reduce uh, they really reduce exposures. And uh, uh, they've uh, at sort of substantial cost, they've put them into uh, a lot of schools along major traffic corridors in, uh, in Los Angeles, and there are, a lot of schools, there are a lot of schools like that. So I think that's an example of, uh, of what, you're, what you're talking about. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not perfect. It's, uh, it's quite expensive uh, to, to do the initial installation, and then it's expensive to maintain them. You've got to use special filters that you, mm -hmm. you have to uh, switch out occasionally. Um, it doesn't these filters don't filter gases. So in the mixture, in the near roadway mixtures, there, there are particles, which is right. what we're most concerned about, but there are also gases, and those aren't p pulled out by, by current, uh, current filters. And then there's you know, the operating conditions of the school. Uh, you know, if the air conditioner doesn't work and they, they uh, open windows, then it doesn't, it doesn't work. So that's, that's in the case of schools. Um, uh, there have been some proposals, and I I think actually there's, the city has had some regulation to, uh, uh, to force new construction like what you see here to put, uh, put uh, filters, filters in. That hasn't been very well studied. It has all the same, uh, same problems with, uh, that you have with, with schools. And um, I think the, the, verdict, the verdict is out whether you can count on that or not. Um, and some of you may have, may have read the, um, the article in the Los Angeles Times that uh, Tony Barbosa wrote uh, a few few weeks ago, where he, he looked at the, the history of um, uh, of this regulation in in new new buildings, uh, you know, new buildings like what you see what you see here. And I think, uh, according to the article, you know, the enforcement's been a bit a bit spotty, and it's not clear how well it's how well it's worked. And it would be you could retrofit old old housing that would be quite. That would be quite expensive. Cost, there. Yeah. I think there'd be a major, uh, a major investment in, in, um, in main, maintaining these free, it, the freestanding it. sort of devices that people might purchase and set in their living room or in the kids' bedroom or something. Is there been much experience with whether those are effective at all? Presumably not for gases, possibly for particulate. Um, yeah, there's some uh, there's there's some research that's been done. I'm, I'm on a. I'm actually. I'm on a, a National Academy of Sciences uh, panel that uh, is advising the State Department on on this because they have employees that live in Beijing and Delhi, you know, places oh, yeah. with sort of very high, uh, very high exposures, and they've done some some very nice uh, some very nice work looking at uh, what happens when you uh, you know you sort of seal up seal up the living quarters, the uh, the house or the apartment, and then. Uh, uh, put in uh, state-of-the-art uh, particle particle filters, and it it can reduce exposures by up to eighty percent. So, under the right circumstances, it works. It works well. Again, it's yeah. it's quite expensive. I mean, it's costly, but it's cheaper than building additional housing in a sense. I mean, there yeah. are given houses that are yeah. or apartments, the ones you showed there, for example. Yeah. You know, whether you could you know mandate in some way or assist people to get some improve filtration or air cleaning in those yeah. places. I mean I think I think you know the the experience of the state department shows that it's possible and you can do it on a you know a fairly large you know they've got 60,000 uh, uh, employees and dependents and they they have programs all over the all over the world so it could, it could it could be done. Thank you. Commissioner Vic I was curious to know um, how the communities were chosen for the children's health study. I didn't see any communities like South LA, Central LA, or East LA that are sort of in the midst of a lot of freeways. So when I was looking at that map earlier, I was just curious on how those communities 
were chosen. Yeah. So those those communities were chosen uh, based on you know these were these were children that were recruited in between kindergarten and fourth grade, and we wanted to be able to follow them through uh, through high school, through high school uh, graduation. And key to the validity of the study is um, is uh, whether how stable, how sort of residentially stable the communities were. So they were they were picked they were picked based on uh, originally based on the regional pollutant mixtures. Uh, so we wanted some clean and some dirty, and then different mixtures of uh, of uh, of, co of uh, uh, pollutants. We had to use sort of all of Southern California, large you know, from the top to the bottom is uh, uh, 200, 200 miles. So it's a it's a big distance to get clean communities, and uh, and then uh, secondarily, we wanted communities where there wasn't any residential uh, turnover. So, you know, un unfortunately, uh, you know, with notable exceptions, uh, communities of lower uh, SES are less residentially uh, stable, and so, you know, rightly or wrongly, you know, our our communities were. Largely middle middle class, and that probably I mean it probably limits the limits the generalizability of the study. Um, in particular, you know our ability to have looked at whether uh, children of lower SES were more susceptible to the effects of uh, of these pollutants, which you could imagine they would be based on the quality of the housing, you know, which might uh, increase the pollutant. Uh, the pollutants that would get into the house, um, uh, diet may have an effect on susceptibility as well. So on, on a variety of factors, that's an interesting question that we didn't address. Thank you. Any other questions from commissioners? Commissioner Sharp. Thank you, Dr. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. McConnell, for your thoughtful remarks. As a advisory body to the city of Los Angeles, I'd uh, be curious for some of your thoughts and suggestions about ways we can, or I should say the city can replicate some of the successes that it appears the Air Resources Board and AQMD have had in reducing the regional contaminants that showed up in those remarkable reductions. Are there specific uh, activities that you saw cities undertaking? We earlier discussed the buffer on the possibility of you know, limiting new housing construction, but as Commissioner Hissrick raged, there's hundreds of thousands living in current Residences. Did any of those other communities take steps to address that residential interface, or were you primarily looking at the positive effects of the ARB and AQMD policy changes? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think as as part of SB 375, there are going to be improvements in in, um, in fuel efficiency and reductions in the amount of pollutants that are coming out of the tailpipe. Uh, of cars, so we're gonna. I think we're gonna. We're gonna get some of those benefits from uh, from that. Um, and uh, you know, we're. It's only been recently that we've seen systematic measurements of of near roadway uh, near roadway uh, pollutants. And there's not a large database yet to be able to follow these longitudinally and be able to tell you know whether they're going up or, or down over time. But I think I think that's that's a major uh, new innovation. Um, I think that, you know, we're, you know, climate change is going to force us to redevelop cities around the world so that people don't have to get into their, uh, into their, into their cars. And I think as it becomes more urgent, you know, as the effects of cl climate change become more clear, I think that, you know, it will be more urgent to do things to redevelop, uh, redevelop the city, and so uh, you know. I think the the anticipation is that that large parts of Los Angeles will become higher density, um, uh, higher density, higher uh, uh, you know denser denser housing, you know more uh, transit transit uh, friendly, and we're increasingly going to see people moving into big uh, big apartment apartment buildings, and uh, that's. That's notwithstanding that there's a lot of old housing stock. I think that's that's an opportunity to uh, 
to build housing that won't be right along major traffic traffic corridors. And these are these are small these are small buffers. You know, if you put them back, if you put major housing back even a block from the freeway, that would that would markedly reduce uh, the uh, the exposure in those in those homes. And that's something that I mean, I'm not I'm not an urban planner, but you know, it seems like that's something that that could be explored and that the city might might think about. And there, I mean, this this conference that I men mentioned that we organized on uh, uh, parks and pollution and obesity, uh, we we engaged some planners from both UCLA and uh, and USC, and there was there was a lot of enthusiasm for thinking about creative uh, solutions to, to to this problem. So I think there I think there's some resources out there that could be brought to bear to to advising the city on how you could how you could fix this moving forward and uh, there are probably some engineering fixes that could also be implemented along the lines of what was suggested to uh, take care of some of the existing housing are there any other questions okay I just have one quick question so I thought that I saw something in that um, LA Times article about building some kind of wall <laughs> between the freeway and a building and have you studied that at all and seen whether or not that's effective in reducing air pollution uh, we um, we haven't studied it but uh, some of our colleagues at UCLA uh, have done some quite interesting research uh, looking looking at that and there there are some modest benefits to putting in uh, very dense uh, foliage next to major roadways or in having sort of a, a tall a tall sound wall that will provide some impedance to the uh, pollutants moving directly through uh, through through communities there's there's really nothing that substitutes for a distance a distance buffer great thank you any other questions thank you so much for coming well thanks uh, thanks for having me I really enjoyed it great presentation okay we'll move on now to public comment um, Wayne Spindler, a.k.a. Tarak Aziz. Yes, and today is the famous 9-11 holiday for most of the Muslims in the world. So, we look at this bullshit about developers. Developers will build, build, build. Because the city is paid off, paid off, paid off by criminals. They don't give a shit about your health. They don't care about your health. Of course the doctor is correct. Building the way they are is going to cause cancer and kill children. But does the city council give a fuck? No! Where's the LA Times reporter that's going to put this in the paper on the front page tomorrow? Top story, LA Times. LA City Health Commission determines that the last five years of development downtown is unsafe. <laughs> because they will not print it. If the LA Times printed it, you know what would happen? Of course, the call would go to the Chicago Tribune. That fucking mafia in Chicago would fire every reporter. So the reporters will remain silent. You will remain silent. Everybody will remain silent. And Mr. Garcetti and that fucking Mike Fuhr and little, little Paul there, what's his name there, Paul Krakorian. <laughs> And then, of course, the biggest criminal of downtown, Jose Wizar, will continue to build unsafe, dangerous conditions for children. And nobody will stop it until one day an attorney will file a class action. And then they will get the damages for all the dead children from the cancer. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Moving on to item number two, which is an election of officers for president. First Vice President, Second Vice President, and Treasurer. And I have asked the City Attorney's Office to um, take over chairing the meeting from here. Thank you, Ms. This is on. Thank you, Ms. Shannon. Um, 
So I guess nominations are now in order uh, for the, we'll start with the Office of President. So nominations are now in order for the Office of President. Um, I would like to nominate Commissioner Vick. Commissioner Vick. Is there any other nominations for uh, President? Seeing none, Commissioner Vick is, um, appears to be the only nominee for president. So I, <laughs> does, it, does it need to be seconded? Uh, no, it does not need to be seconded. Uh, okay. No, I, I don't believe it has to be seconded. No. Okay, great. So, all in favor of, I, I guess it would be unanimous, but all in favor of Ms. Vick. Aye. 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 I guess roll would need to be taken, so. Yes, please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Commissioner Griffith. Can I you just point, he had a question. I oh. just couldn't hear what was being said. What, so. what, uh, for the nomination of Ms. Vick as president, so we're taking roll. I th yeah, I if think they're in favor of Ms. Vick as president. If I could do a point of information, I think it's by acclamation if there's only one candidate, correct? That would be true oh, as well, yes. Okay. So, Ms. Vick, congratulations. <laughs> now we can move for nominations for first vice president. I'll, I'll nominate uh, Commissioner Sharp. Yeah. I, oh, I don't have the picture. Okay. Commissioner Sharp. Is there any other nominations for first vice president? Seeing none, then by acclamation, Mr. Sharp. Congratulations. And now we can move to uh, nominations for second uh, vice president. Are there any nominations? Dr. Mandel. Dr. Mandel has been nominated for second vice president. Any other nominations for second vice president? Seeing none, congratulations, Dr. Mandel. Thank you. You are second vice president. So we can move on to the I think the last was is treasurer. Uh, any nominations for treasurer? I would like to nominate Commissioner Hisserich. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't need to do it. I'll nominate Mr. Hisserich. Thank you. 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 Commissioner Conn. Can a commissioner hold two offices or not? It's going to check um, Robert Rule's order just to make sure uh, whether that is an except whether that's acceptable. It's not in the bylaws, so we want to make sure if it's not in the bylaws if it's if it act can actually occur. I, I believe in corporate law you can have two. Um, I, th I think you can have a president and but you can I don't think you can be president and secretary, but I think you'd be president in one other um, office. So we're just checking, because but I believe 
Dr. Mandel, I think you were, but I believe in corporate law, you're correct. You can have two offices. Commonly, there's a secretary who's also a treasurer in many corporations. And commonly, there's a senior vice president in, in corporations who also serves as general counsel or alternatively as um, a treasurer. Just give us one moment. There, I think this is more of a discretion of the commission. If the commission would like someone to be, have both positions, that's not in Robert Rules of Order, and under, I would think, corporate law, it's acceptable. Is there, Commissioner Mandel, did you have a, a, did you want to nominate somebody for that position? Not necessarily, but, <laughs> I mean, I, it looks like there's a, resistance of several of the commissioners to want to be treasurer. Um, I don't believe that the uh, responsibilities of the second vice president would be that difficult that I'd be willing to accept the nomination for the treasurer and serve and do the duties of that position. I don't believe it would be too difficult to handle two of those, but I don't want to overstep my, my bounds uh, as a commissioner. I think we could also leave it open and see if some of the, at least one of the commissioners that's not here might be interested in doing that, that job. And just call um, an election or special election thereafter, because I don't know. Mr. Sharp, will you? number of questions regarding that budget line item, how the allocation appropriation of those funds is working from an FTE standpoint, et cetera. That's sort of an open question, which from a responsibility standpoint, would be great for someone to bring back a little information and discuss. That's distinct from the usual role of treasurer in an organization, which is preparing and approving an annual budget, requesting audit, et cetera. Uh, so I think that's the near-term need that needs to be met, which could be handled by any commissioner, I guess. Uh, regardless of whether the position is open or filled, but that would be the current responsibility on the table. And therefore, after that very long paragraph, my recommendation is that someone raise his or her hand uh, to undertake that responsibility, regardless of whether it's uh, codified in a role as treasurer or not. Dr. Mandel, if you, I mean, if, if I'm, re if we're reading Robert Rules of Order, you can actually, you can nominate yourself for the position if you so choose. Then I would nominate myself for treasurer, with the understanding that I'm more than willing to give up one of the officerships if individuals who are currently not here and tend not to come often to the meetings. Um, decide they want one of those positions, I, I, I would nominate myself and be willing to step down from either of those positions uh, later on if there's a, another willing participant and also individual who will do the job as um, described. So I, I'll nominate myself. Any other nominations for treasurer? Seeing none, congratulations Dr. Mandel. And that concludes uh, the election. Thank you. Okay, let's move to item number three, discussion of public comment protocol. Um, this was continued from the September 1st meeting. Um, so is there any comment or discussion around this issue? Yes, Commissioner Sharp, I'm sorry. I take 
full responsibility for this having been inserted in the bylaws and in the agenda. I believe there are four aspects of managing public comment that I advise the, or advise, I encourage the commission to consider uh, to align the commission practices in a way that's consistent with other city commissions, including the other city commission I serve on and the city council committees, which I occasionally have the opportunity to speak in front of on behalf of various clients. And I think there's four parts to how public comment is done. One is the duration of the comment. The second is whether comments are bundled, whether when a speaker has comments on multiple items. The third is how to notify and manage comments to be germane to the specific agenda item and or to the work of the commission as a whole. And then the fourth is the use of electronic devices at the microphone. Those are my four distinctions between how public comment is managed in other settings and has is, is not been managed here. And it's my recommendation, I guess, that the commission take some action step to adopt and communicate on the written agendas in, in future meetings uh, a, you know, a, a particular protocol that's in closer alignment with those. I am not unaware that in recent meetings there has not been much public comment, period. But I am also mindful that over the last 20 months, we've lost a number of commissioners, two of whom explicitly stated in correspondence to me that it was the unmanaged public comment that made the meetings less pleasant. I certainly uh, am open to hearing dissenting views and a range of uh, remarks, profanity, et cetera. It's not the content of the comment. It's the lack of relevance to the substantive discussion here that other commissions are managing in slightly different ways. And so my recommendation uh, would be that I, that gets adopted, or I should say that some uh, similar formula to how it's being used in other settings be adopted and printed on the agendas, which I think is fair to notify stakeholders of those new expectations going forward as opposed to imposing it in the middle of a meeting. So I think that's my uh, reason for trying to bring this forward. And I welcome uh, alternate views, dissenting views, or supporting views. Commissioner Sharp, I have to actually make a, a backtrack. I made my first mistake as president. We need to go back to uh, comment for item number two. So I will call up Adam Cohen. My apologies. It's my first day. <laughs> Thank you, President. Um, my name is Adam Cohen. I am the Director of Advocacy and Policy Research for AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Um, I want to let you know that we sent a later letter to the LA City Council today requesting that they uh, not only fill the remaining five seats of the commission, but also ensure that there is a uh, moment in time at the future meeting to where you can present on the uh, health report. And so I hope that works through. And I've been continually contacting each of the um, five city council members who have not appointed somebody to strongly, strongly recommend that they do so sooner than later. Um, but I look forward to seeing how the next round goes. And I do look forward to some time in the very near future seeing the LA City Council listen to what you have to say about public health in LA City. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Tarek Aziz. Well, the first thing you have to do is, is, since you took the election without public comment, you have to reopen, reconsider, and revote the entire item, or you violate 54950 of the Brown Act. Isn't it amazing how you pay attorneys with bar cards, and they're so fucking numb in the head that they would even allow that to happen? on your first vote. You know, that's what's so funny about all that's why I bring my puppet. You people are humorous. I get my entertainment watching people with degrees. You could fill this room with plaques and degrees and awards and cert citations. The education in this room is 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 doctorates degrees, JDs. And everybody acts like little children because they don't want to hear from the public. You got two people here in a city of four million people. It's called failure. This commission died with Bill Rosendahl. It's a failure. That's the first thing you got to say. We can't even get people in here. We failed. And the fact that you can't stop the developers from developing all that crap by the freeway after this guy just told you it kills people, failure. 
So you're not doing nothing. So the treasurer, whatever, whoever the treasurer is, the best thing you could do with your funding, seriously, give it all to me. Give me all of your budget. Just transfer it to me. Give it to me right now. Put it in a bag and give it to me. Let me walk away from the city with, a, with it as damages for all the shit that her blessings put me through for three years. Okay, three years. Okay, I watch you guys violate the law. You're going to read a story tonight in the press that Herb Wesson went to the state bar and filed two false charges against my bar card, and I caught him. You're going to read that story tonight. Fuck the city of Los Angeles. Thank you. Now we can move to item three, correct, or do we need to do... satisfied uh, prior to the election. Now that public comment has been satisfied, we can go, we can do this uh, rather quickly with the okay. elections again, if that's, if everyone will so choose, but uh, unaware that there was uh, any such public comment, um, let's, we can do this again. So now that it has been satisfied, we can go to the, to the election. Okay. So, not, not, is there, Outcome, uh, I was going to say. Was there any objections to the confirmation of the officers previously chosen? Seeing no objections, then that election would stand. As Ms. Vick as president, Mr. Sharp as first vice president, Dr. Mandel as Second Vice President, Dr. Mandel as Treasurer. Is there any objection? No objection? Okay. So item three is also uh, related to a motion, so do I need to do the comment, public comment first? move forward to item three? No. Okay. Yes, there is a card. Okay. Mohammed Atta, item three. Go ahead there. Yes, again. The, the Sharpie, the man named after a pen, continues to try to limit public comment because he's hurt by the puppet. And my, my sister, Papita Pig, the other puppet that you've seen here, and she's currently uh, on hiatus, so I'm bullying bull. I'm the more precocious puppet of the two years, and I, I use proper language. And I've read the Brown Act. I'm the only one here who's read the Brown Act. What about me? Yeah, you Okay, two of us have read the Brown Act. So they know, and you know today, that the Board of Public Works, they had a three-hour meeting, more like a war. They wanted to bundle and bunch and change all the rules to limit the puppet to a mere three minutes of public comment on items. But the other commissioners stopped the evil, yes. After myself and my friend here, Mr. Spindler, threatened the fucking lawsuit, yes, because we're already suing the city, so all you have to do is file an amended complaint. A very simple process at this point, because rather than just doing our own thing, we've had to read in the last three years 18,000 pages of certified copies and law dealing with 42 U.S.C. 1983 and criminal law because Mike Fuhr tried to put my friend here in jail in one fucking year for having an assault rifle that was bought legally. Yes. So, fuck you and fuck you sharp. No more limits on public comment. Okay, let's 
move into discussion. Commissioner Sharp had already made some I have nothing else to say. wonderful comments. Are there any other comments around discussion of public comment protocol? I have a question. The public comment, my understanding, should be to the items that are being discussed and not just freely spoken. How do we enforce if we allow two minute times for each uh, item? Um, somebody who is not discussing the issue at hand. Well, usually it's the uh, president that is empowered with uh, enforcing the rules of uh, making the public comments uh, relevant to a specific item. There is, uh, for a general comment on any item that's under jurisdiction, there's a separate item uh, called public uh, public comment, but for any other uh, uh, specified items, uh, it's the uh, chair the chair of the meeting that would usually enforce the rule and then ask the public speaker uh, to make the uh, make the comment relevant. Um, and uh, usually, public public speakers are able to do that. Uh, another thing that the city council does is that uh, city council rule usually is adopted by almost all the commissions that I'm aware of, is five minutes per person per day so that other speakers can have uh, time to address the uh, legislative body. So is uh, that a bylaw? Would that have to be a bylaw change, or is that just the operation of the, of the commissions? It's the resolution by the uh, commission that would satisfy that uh, rule. So in theory, given that this has already been um, agenda eyes today, one could today make a motion to limit uh, the total length of time of public comment by one individual who's come here to five minutes? Yes. Or um, even uh, more succinct, uh, more, uh, I think the better motion would be to actually follow the city council chamber rule because they have the same rule. And um, uh, those rules are actually reviewed peri periodically by the city attorneys. Uh, you know, after long discussions, we I think we usually discuss this uh, the Brown Act public comment issue about once every year uh, with maybe about 30 attorneys in in room. So if there's a change, then you know I think you're better protected by put, by following the city council chamber rule as opposed to. Um, having this commission's own rule. So, so what you're advising is is that um, to logistically it would make more sense because it's a moving target what the city council would do and because they're doing due diligence into um, reviewing the Brown Act and also uh, open discussion uh, at, at their meetings that we could then adopt what the rules of the city council are for our commission in regards to public comment? That's correct. With a, with a, with a motion and a second as yes. per. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Shannon? I don't know that it's appropriate that we do that because our agenda actually just says discussion of public comment. It doesn't say discussion and action. Oh. oh. So I don't know if a motion is appropriate for now as opposed to the next meeting. Maybe we could take that up as a first item. I did not realize that it was for discussion Wait, only today, mm -hmm. but you could make that motion. Um, you could put it over to the next um, uh, meeting for an action. So, so will we make that motion today? Yes. Or um, yes, you can make that motion today. And any. Uh, there's an exception for uh, an action item uh, under the Brown Act in that you can always make a motion to agendize any, any item during the next meeting. So, so at any time when you're having a meeting like this, you can actually have a, have a motion without having it specified in the agenda uh, to have it on the next agenda. So if you were to make a motion today to have uh, you know, this item back again for action, during the next meeting, then um, it should be on the agenda. And if it gets passed, then it should be on the next agenda. Commissioner Sharp? Yeah, I 
Is there any further discussion or was there a proposed motion? I think that would be during the next agenda item, which is items for future discussion. Okay. Discussion only? No, no. It'd be, I, I thought one could make a motion and have it seconded today and that motion would then be an action item at the next meeting. No, no, your action, if you make a motion to agendize it for next meeting, then that act, that motion can be acted upon today, although that action item is not on the agenda. So let's say you were to make a motion to have uh, the public comment uh, policy as an action item on, on the next agenda and somebody second it, then we will have a motion um, we'll have to take a uh, you know, vote to see if that, mo um, that motion passes. Correct, but so the, the, the motion that would be passing would be so that it's on the agenda, that's not correct. necessarily that it's enforced. Right. Right. Or accepted. That's right. Correct. That's, I think that, that was our understanding. Okay. Commissioner Shannon? Right. So at the retreat, the motion that was made that was that there be a discussion. It needed, the motion needed to be discussion and or action if you wanted to take action on a specific motion at this meeting. So you and Commissioner Sharp made that motion. Right. Right. But it sounds like a motion can be made now to right. put something on on the agenda. Right, and that would probably be better on item number four, which is items for future discussion. Well, there's need to, there doesn't necessarily need to be more discussion. We're allowing as much discussion to all the commissioners today, as well as to the public to comment on our discussion. And all it needs to be is, the vote needs to be agendized for next meeting. Commissioner Shannon? If I can make a recommendation, when we get to item number four, if you just make a motion to say, for the next agenda, I'd like discussion and or action on public comment, then you can take a vote at the next meeting. Any further discussion? Okay. Agenda item number four, items for future discussion. I move that the commission agendize a discussion and or action regarding public comment protocol procedure for the October meeting. Okay, all right. Second. We have to do comments first. I'm getting a little bit of a miscommunication Madam on Madam President, I think we're, we were still on the, uh, Commissioner Sharp was still on item number three. No, no. we had moved he had to four. We have moved to four. Okay. Because I'd asked for further discussion and no one had further discussion. So for public comment, I thought the comments were first if there was a motion. For item four. Okay, so, so we are doing public comment first for item four. Okay. Mr. Spindler. Yes, uh, I'll take this one. Go ahead. First of all, the puppet did very well. I thought his dissertation on the Brown Act was quite good for a puppet. Thank you. So, our, uh, we have a number of city councilmen that haven't appointed anybody to the seats on this commission. And, uh, well, probably they can't get any volunteers. It's, you're not stealing enough money. You know, this is the problem. You don't have enough money to steal, so if you can't steal money, you can't get volunteers. You know, 50 bucks in a free salad isn't going to do the trick, right? 
So, and it's funny, the chair still won't take the chair behind you. you sit in the chair where the chairman sits. You can't, the mighty Herb Wesson you worship, so you can't even sit in his chair, you know. You're afraid he might say something. The chair sits in the chair, the one behind you there, you see. You know, this is a, it's a broken city. It's got a broken charter, broken elections, a city attorney's office that's just in complete ethical chaos. You know, you got a city attorney, Mike Fuhrer, that files false criminal charges and abuses his prosecutorial power on one hand. And then on the other hand, he's supposed to advise you on ethics, civil liability, and civil litigation. It's, it's not a marriage made in heaven. It's a complete disaster. And we know now that the very head of the president the very leader who's leading the staff in the Bar Association is actually on an active status. And it's quite amazing that uh, this has happened four times. Every rock you unturn, you find more corruption under it. More and more and more corruption. I can spend the next 20 years uncovering the corruption in this city and county. And nobody does a damn thing about it. So I really believe, I know some of you are well-intentioned, you should all resign. You're absolutely just wasting your time trying to do this. It's really a waste of time. Commission, any items for future discussion? Oh, he already made the mo he already did. Okay. Commissioner Sharp, I think perhaps this is a time to make uh, make your motion that you have you stated earlier. Did he make it? Did he make it already? Right. It was made and seconded. Correct. Why don't we redo it? I'm happy to make the motion again in light of the uh, uh, remarks in response to public comment or following public comment. I guess I, I move that at the next health commission meeting. The Health Commission discuss and or take action to adopt uh, the City Council protocol for public comment. Second. Comments? Vote. All four? Aye. Aye. I can't hear anything, but I'm Oh, okay. Anyone opposed? Abstentions? One is abstention. Oh, I didn't vote. I. Okay. So that will be on the next agenda. Any more um, items for future discussion? Commissioner Shannon? So I would like to move that we have a hearing um, next month regarding the buffer zone for oil and gas. Um, the, which the Petroleum Administrator Uduakna took asked us um, to, to basically address uh, at our October meeting. And um, this would be a hearing, uh, I could say, and or action uh, in case we wanted to make a recommendation. Um, the point of it really is to hear from stakeholders, not necessarily for us to, to make a recommendation on that. Um, I think we should leave it open just for the sake of flexibility. So is there a second for that? I'll second. Okay. Okay. Discussion, correct? Discussion? Okay. Uh, all, all four, aye? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? All right. So we will work on that. Any other items for discussion? Commissioner Mendel? I would uh, suggest that we um, discuss um, in improving the number of commissioners and um, see what we could do as commissioners to increase the, uh, to try to get 15 um, active members uh, on the commission. And with that, I would um, suggest that, that we each seek out individuals to uh, be on the commission and submit um, curriculum vitae um, to the K 
council members who currently do not have individuals um, so they could select people or nominate people. Um, in addition to that, would ask that we also discuss having our own um, curriculum vitae and or uh, biograph sent so that individuals know who we all are and what our strengths are so we could seek out individuals who can complement our knowledge base. Commissioner Sh uh, Shannon? So when the commission was first formed, they actually put all of our biographies up on the website. So they may still be up there. If not, the city clerk's office um, should have that document. Because um, I remember looking over it um, before the commission uh, started in November of 2015. So. Um, maybe a president can ask the city clerk's office to post that on the website if it isn't there and it may still be there. So I would say check the website. Okay. Okay. Commissioner Cato? Uh, do we know um, which council districts are without uh, commissioners at this time? Yes, I don't have that information offhand, but we're aware of which ones are missing. Um, Commissioner Shannon? So, Gil Cedillo, um, David Rue, Murray Martinez, um, um, Bob, Blumenfeld. Bob Blumenfeld, and Joe Buscaino. Joe Buscaino. That's right. Okay. And there have been several people I know who have called the offices. Um, to try to get an appointment, and I don't know where things are in the process for that. Other ideas or discussion around this issue, or any others for future discussion? Okay, meeting is adjourned. <laughs>